Welcome to Flipping Fantastic. This video is an introduction to my OLC workshop on the flipped classroom model, which gives us the potential to do fantastic things for learning. The flipped classroom is not, as the picture might imply, a class literally flipped on its head, of course, but it's one where students take what is normally done in the classroom and they do it at home, like lecture or instructor commentary or even discussions. And then they take what is done at home and that gets brought into the classroom. Things like problem solving or any exercises that promote deeper cognitive skills. My name is Ellen Smith and I teach introductory statistics for Austin P State University out at our little Fort Campbell Center and I teach during a shortened eight-week term to accommodate our soldiers. My students are highly non-traditional. They've been away from math for years and in many cases even decades and so many of my students have forgotten algebra completely. Teaching statistics to students who don't know algebra is a little bit of a challenge, as you might imagine. And I also want my students to gain a truly deep understanding of the material that we cover in class. But the depth of learning always seems to be at war with the breadth of material that we have to cover in an introductory statistics course, especially given the shortened eight-week time frame and the algebraic deficiencies that we're dealing with. So what interests me and excites me most about the flipped classroom model is that it offers a solution to the breadth versus depth dilemma. By flipping the classroom, I get to have both. And I hope that this model can do the same for you. By completing all phases of this workshop, attendees will lose one lecture and gain a lesson by building their own complete flipped classroom cycle of activities and assignments to replace a single lecture. And by flipped classroom cycle, this is what I mean, that the flipped classroom can be broken down into pre, peri, and post-class activities. So pre-class activities is going to include everything that the student does before class begins to start the learning process. So they're not gonna wait until class begins to start learning. They're gonna start learning at home with these pre-class activities. And then Perry is everything that's done during class to continue the learning process, to deepen the learning that's already happened at home. And then post includes everything that students will do after class to reinforce and to synthesize what has been learned before and during class. All three of these stages for one cycle will be covering the same content. I like to cover about a chapter at a time. On the difficult chapters, I cover about half of a chapter at a time. And during the workshop, we'll discuss and we'll decide exactly which levels of learning and which activities we should use at each stage as attendees will be designing their own pre, peri, and post-class cycle using previous lecture slides that they're going to bring with them to the workshop. So the workshop participants will get to take these designs that we build during the workshop home with them and then fully flesh them out into complete assignments and activities for all three stages so that they'll have one complete flipped classroom adventure that will replace a lecture. The entire workshop also follows this same model, of course, of pre, peri, and post-workshop activities, and this video kicks off the pre-workshop activities. A staple of the flipped classroom is instructional video. You don't have to use video with the flipped classroom, and we'll see examples of flipped classes that don't use any video, but Video is one of the most, if not the most, efficient way for students to be able to achieve the lowest levels of learning. So during this workshop, we will storyboard one lecture we intend to flip, and we'll record a very rough snippet of that lecture, and it may or may not match the storyboard that we've created, and then we'll perform edits to that recorded video. 
We're definitely not going for a polished end product here, but what we want to give you is enough experience during the workshop when we have each other to help each other out in learning how to use your devices to record and edit, and then you'll be able to go home and create an effective polished video. A couple of our pre-workshop videos will cover video and screencast recording and editing to help give you a little background information before we do what we do in the workshop. And what I like to ask myself before I decide if I want to attend a workshop or a session is what can this do for me? What can I take home from this particular session? So when you actually do all of the three cycles, the pre-workshop activities, the during workshop activities, and the post-workshop activities, what you'll have is a complete set of everything to flip a classroom. And when you actually flip that class, you should see students who are much more actively engaged in the content during class, especially if you compare it to how engaged they were during lecture. And then the second thing is that you'll be able to either cover more content or you'll be able to give students a much deeper understanding of the content that you're already covering. Or I do a little bit of both actually and I like it that way. And then the last thing you'll be able to do is create these learners who are independent and self-directed. And that's exactly what employers are looking for. And sometimes learners can be a little bit resistant to being so independent from you for those first two phases. But if you'll just remind them that this is exactly what people who are gonna hire you want to see. And so independent employees who can take initiative to figure out the stuff they need to do on their own, yeah, that's, that's the people who are gonna get hired and promoted. And so I want you to think about this question, is active learning better or is passive learning better? So doing activities in class, is that better? Or is it better to lecture and have students passively listen and take notes? And while you think about this question, I'm going to give you a scenario of active learning versus passive learning, and it's a it's an extreme scenario. So imagine you're going to have a very complicated, very dangerous surgery and your life depends on this situation. Uh, you have two choices. Both are 30 year old women who are students of surgery and both have spent their entire adult life, 12 years, doing different types of learning. One is actively learning and one is passively learning. So the first student has spent her entire adult life in medical school surrounded by surgical experts who have lectured her 12 hours a day while she's taken a lot of notes. They have operated in front of her and she stood by and watched and taken notes and they've explained things, what they're doing while she's been listening. But this student has never been in a lab setting and never been asked to complete outside assignments. Or on the other hand, let's pretend that we have a, an also 30 year old student who has spent her entire adult life in the operating room actually performing surgery. She's also surrounded by surgical experts. Instead of lecturing her though, they have guided her and given her specific feedback as she's performed surgery after surgery for 12 hours a day all of her adult life. And so this student was never in a lecture setting. She's never heard speeches from renowned experts. She's never read any medical books. All of her experience is purely hands-on. Which surgeon would you choose? Well, I would always, always, always go with the person who had actual hands-on experience doing surgery over a person who has watched other people do surgery but has never, ever tried it herself until she's going to try it on me. Um, that's me. You don't have to take my word for it, though. Let's look at actual research instead of just one extreme scenario. Uh, and I'm going to look at two different studies, but these studies are studies of studies, and so there's actually hundreds and hundreds of studies that are represented here. And so the first study that we look at comes to us in June of this year, June of 2014, and Scott Freeman published a meta-analysis of 225 different studies on active learning versus passive learning, and this got published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And what he found was, as you can see, 
overwhelming evidence that active learning is actually better than passive learning. And then in our second study, we have Michael Prince, who did a meta-analysis as well of hundreds of different active learning studies. This is an older compilation, though. It was published in 2004, but he also found support for every different form of active learning. But what he found, I thought, was pretty interesting, that's that all active learning is not created equal. So some of the active learning techniques were definitely better than others, much, much better. And during the workshop, we're going to explore the three types of active learning that this research showed to be superior. And we're going to try to apply that on our PERI class or during class activities. So I'm going to digress for just a second uh, and confess to you one of my deepest, darkest secrets. I'm an Ashton Kutcher fangirl, not in the sense that you might think, not in the squealing sense, but I'm a fan of his intellect and his philosophies. Uh, so each time I see Ashton Kutcher, I keep expecting Kelso from that 70s show to just appear. But when he actually opens his mouth, I find myself shocked by uh, the difference and the brilliance. In a speech to teens that he gave about a year ago, I think, uh, he shared how other people, his friends, kept telling him how lucky he was to have had all the breaks that he's had and all the opportunities that he's had, and he's just so lucky. But Ashton says luck has nothing to do with it. He says opportunity doesn't look like luck opportunity doesn't fall in your lap. Opportunity looks a lot like hard work. And I think the same can be said of learning. Learning doesn't just happen to someone. Learning doesn't just fall in your lap. Learning looks a lot like hard work. And so the harder students work, as long as they're working in the right direction and not working the problem incorrectly, uh, the more students are going to learn. The harder they work, the more they learn. And that just makes so much sense to me. And that's where active learning comes from, I think. The biggest reason that students learn more through active learning is that they are working harder and working in the right direction because they're getting constant guidance and feedback from their peers and especially from their professor. Why would we even lecture if all of this is true? If active learning really is better, why should we lecture at all? What is the benefit? I think there still is a big benefit. And I think that Keith Whittington said it best. I was in one of his sessions at the teaching professor conference years back, and it was an active, active, active learning session. And when we got finished with his 80 minutes of doing all activity after activity after activity, one of the participants raised her hand and she said, do you do this all day long in class? And he was like, oh my goodness, no, no. I do a little bit of activities and a little bit of lecturing. And his reason he gave was, I think, priceless. He said, lecturing is the single most efficient way to dump knowledge. And a lot of people, a lot of professors sort of blanched at the idea of dumping knowledge, but he didn't mean to throw it away. He wasn't trash talking knowledge. What he meant here was that by lecturing, we are flooding our students with an instant transfer of massive amounts of information. So we're just dumping all of this stuff on top of them. And I just see a huge sort of um, picture of a big dump truck throwing out lots of information to students. And so, you know, with that in mind, to me, the lecturing is what gives us our breath. And then the active learning, doing activities in class, is what really fosters the depth. And so you've got lecture on the one hand that solves the one problem, and active learning on the other hand that solves the other problem. But can we really do both? I mean, our class time is just so limited. Keith Whittington said he did both and seemed to get by just fine, but I was doing both and still it wasn't, it wasn't enough to cover what I felt like we needed to cover in the time that we had to cover it. And I think that can be especially true of blended classes where your class time is cut back severely. Is there really time to do all of this awesome stuff? And I think the answer is yes, especially after I've done the flipped classroom. There is time for breadth if we cover lectures at home. 
and we can use instructional videos as pre-class assignments and cover all the breadth that we need. And then that gives us 100% of class time or almost 100% of class time to do nothing but activities that will increase the learning levels to higher order thinking and higher order learning. So by flipping the class, we are essentially solving the breadth versus depth dilemma and we get both. Here's another question I want us to think about. Think about the classroom and what are the two most valuable resources that you have in the classroom? And so that's probably gonna be things that students don't have at home that's very specific to the classroom that most students won't have access to at home. I'm hoping that you're thinking of people because people are always our most valuable resources. And the professor, surely, is an awesome, valuable resource, but often the students get overlooked, but the students themselves are incredible learning resources. They can really teach each other a lot of things. And so our goal in this workshop is really to leverage these MVPs, these most valuable players from the classroom. And that's gonna be the professor feedback and the peer feedback. And we're gonna leverage these to maximize learning. Everything that we do before class is so that we can take full advantage of our class time. And everything that we do after class is gonna support the stuff that we've learned during class. And so everything as we design our flipped class is gonna be around this idea that the most important stuff is gonna happen in the classroom. In order to maximize learning, we really need to understand how learning works and the order that learning works. So one of the most highly regarded learning theorists out there is Bloom and his taxonomy of learning levels that can be used to describe the order in which learning happens. So you'll see that Bloom said, first we know or remember, and then we understand, and then we apply, and then the last three levels is a little bit debatable and a little bit fluid, but essentially most learning theorists agree that we analyze, evaluate, and create, and those three are higher orders of learning. The order that they occur in, though, they're a little more fluid on those right side feathers, but everyone pretty much agrees that the, the first three stages happen in that order and uh, the last three stages are higher than the first three stages. And so the peacock is one of my favorite representations of Bloom's taxonomy, because not only do we get a peacock, but we get all six levels of Bloom's taxonomy, and we get these awesome little verbs that tell us exactly what is meant by each of the levels, and that gives us ideas and examples of the types of questions that we should be asking during each of the levels. And hopefully that'll come in useful as we design our pre, peri, and post-class activities. This is also a representation of Bloom's taxonomy. I've broken it down into the first two levels of learning, the very basics, and then the other four levels are much more complex. And if we think of the traditional classroom model, as it relates to Bloom's taxonomy, students come into the classroom as brand new babies in the material that we're trying to cover uh, because they've never been introduced to the material before and we just spoon feed them the information. If we are lucky, really, really lucky, the students will leave the classroom with remembering and understanding, at least until they get home. And then when they get home, we ask them not just to remember, not just to understand, but to do all of the really hard stuff. We ask them to apply and to analyze and to evaluate and to create. And so we're making all of this hard stuff be done completely on their own. And we're surprised when the babies that we spoon fed in the classroom aren't able to go home and dress themselves and run and teach themselves all these fabulous things. What really happens is we, we think they're not capable of doing this stuff. So what can we do about that? Well, the basic levels, 
that's the stuff that students should be doing independently. We shouldn't ask them to do the really complex stuff all by themselves. They need help with that. And so we can assign the very basic parts of learning to be learned independently. And that's when pre-class activities come in. So why we need pre-class activities is so that they can do the easy stuff by themselves. And then they knock out the basics at home before they come to class. During class, we get to focus on at least two or three, maybe even a little bit of all four of the most complex orders of learning. And part of our pre-class activities will be hearing from Eric Mazur, who teaches physics to medical students at Harvard University. And he discovered, almost by accident, that even though his very brilliant students were passing his computationally rigorous exams with ease, they didn't understand the fundamental principles of Newtonian physics. And that's what the entire course was based on. So he gives this brilliant 80 minute lecture and it's 80 minutes long, but it's still awesome. And he explains why he gave up lecture in an 80 minute lecture. Hope the irony isn't lost on you. But despite the length and despite the fact that it's lecture, it's actually really engaging stuff and tremendously inspiring. So I hope that you will check out the 80 minute lecture on my blog, especially if you are in the math and sciences or any problem solving subject. If not, there's a shorter 18 minute version. And so I'll encourage you to check out the shorter version if you aren't in the problem solving areas. And then I also want to give you a little taste of what I discovered in my own flipped classroom experiment. So last year, my colleague James Sanders and I randomly assigned students. All of them were signed up for the same course. We assigned them to either my flipped class or his traditional class using a random number generator. And then in our classes, we covered the same content. We used the same midterm and final exams. We gave the same standardized pretest and post test. And that was the CAOS test, which stands for the Comprehensive Assessment of Outcomes in a First Statistics course. Unfortunately, we had a really small enrollment that term. And so after splitting into two classes, it just wasn't enough to yield statistically significant results. But I'm going to share the results with you because the differences were practically significant, even though not statistically significant, and let you conclude what you will about them. So here are my results, and each dot represents a student. The red dots are the students in the flipped classroom, and the blue dots are the students in the traditional lecture-based classroom with some activities, but mostly lecture. Along the bottom axis, you have the pretest scores, and then along the side axis, you have the midterm scores. And you might not be able to tell, but the traditional students scored a little bit better on the pretest than the flip students did. But then the flip students scored five points higher on average on the midterm exam. So even though the flip students started with a little disadvantage, or at least that's what's implied by the pretest scores, they came out on top on the midterm scores, and then they really came out on top 11 points higher on average on the final exam scores. And then looking at the CAOS results, each bar represents a student and the bar height represents the gain in knowledge as measured by the difference between the CAOS post-test minus the CAOS pretest. And so that difference um, is disconcertingly negative for some students. We are really hoping that's due to variability and not actual loss in knowledge. And we think that's true because it happened to other studies as well. But on average, the gains in the flipped classroom, the red, was twice as much for individual students as the gains that were in blue, the traditional class. And then our most interesting results came not from midterm scores and pre and post test scores and final scores, but I thought it came from the surveys. So the first survey question I asked was how much time approximately did you spend outside of class 
studying this material. And I told them not to count class time and not to count the algebra lab, which makes up for algebraic deficiencies. And they said that they spent, the FLIP students, only spent about half as much time learning outside of the classroom. So the traditional students were spending twice as much time studying as the flipped, but yet they were scoring lower on the midterm and much lower on the final exam, and their overall learning, as measured by the standardized pre- and post-test, was only half as much. So they were studying twice as much, but they only learned half as much. So by flipping the classroom, we're making the class much more efficient, so students have to study less total time, and yet they're learning at a much deeper level, especially on the concepts that were measured on the pre and post test. And then five times as many FLIP students described the class time as helpful, and almost twice, not quite twice, as many strongly agreed that they learned a lot in the course. And so that's all I have for this video. If you were interested in these ideas, and I hope that you were, you can find more materials supporting this workshop on my blog, flippingfantastic.wordpress.com. Thank you.